Hello, my fellow subjects out there. This is the Aromantic Shipper back in with yet another video. So this week, we are going to be taking a look at She-Ra and the Princess of Power, which is, of course, a Netflix adaptation of the classic 80s series of the same name. Just as a disclaimer, I have not watched the original series and so will not be referencing it at all in this video essay. How, honestly, from what I understand, I don't really think I need to know anything about the original series since the reboot is very different from the original in a lot of key ways. The most prevalent being that the reboot is simply oozing with the big gay energy, whereas the original was only slightly leaking it. Oh, I know you're here, Adora. Come out. In all seriousness, though, I absolutely love the 2018 She-Ra reboot. It's one of my favorite cartoons to come out in the modern era. And while a bunch of neckbeards online were lambasting it for being too woke and Adora being too mannish or something. This is a boy. It's an androgynous male lesbian character. It looks like a, a gender, an androgynous gender, gender questionable thing. Okay. This show has far more to offer than diversity. I don't think the show is perfect and it does have its problems. The action scenes, for example, are mostly fine, but are usually just missing that certain oomph that makes you really want to go back and rewatch them. The series also doesn't have the best world building and often overlooks some important key details, and some things aren't explored to their full potential. However, where the show really excels in is the fantastic writing, the gut-busting humor, the transcendent soundtrack and music. And, of course, the best thing about the show, the characters, who are incredibly entertaining and interesting, especially the central characters. I would say I only really dislike two characters out of the whole cast of the show. And no, by the way, neither of them are Swift Wind. I don't understand why people hate this damn horse. I think he's funny. Did someone say Shira? <laughs> no one did. No, it's Discount Toff and Wine Ant. If you want a video talking more in depth about the absolutely masterful way in which Shira utilizes its cast as best as possible by putting them in situations where dynamic developments naturally take place, I strongly recommend checking out Vog Jam's video on the series. It's probably my favorite video essay on the series out there. And he's a smaller creator with only a few thousand subscribers like me who thankfully has gotten more attention over the past few months, but I still think he deserves more because he's awesome. I mean, I assume he is. I don't know. He might be a serial killer in real life or something, but uh, all I know is that his videos are really great and you should definitely go sub to him. But anyway, I knew I wanted to talk about this show ever since I finished watching it, but I couldn't quite settle on a topic to talk about. But then I realized, wait a minute, I'm the aromantic shipper. It's in the title. I should just talk about shipping. How did I never see it before? Plus, my two Attack on Titan shipping videos became my third and second most viewed videos on my channel, respectively, so why not try to, try to do the same thing with She-Ra? And what better ship to talk about than the classic story of one clueless lesbian slowly coming to the realization that she's a furry? It's okay, Adora. Truth is, we all are. And those who say they aren't are in denial. Catradora, the shipping name for the pairing of the series' principal protagonist and antagonist, is by far the most popular ship in the series. It's not hard to see why. Catra and Adora are both very attractive young women, in addition to both being great characters with an intimate connection to one another, and sexual tension levels off the fucking charts. The ship was finally confirmed in the series finale, and all the Catradora shippers rejoiced. This ship is mostly well received by the fandom. However, there is a smaller but significant number of people who are quite critical of Catradora, and over the years I began noticing them more and more. Now, one's first instinct might be to accuse these people of just being haters or being homophobic, but while that might be the case for some of them, th and there is a lot of toxic negativity towards this show, undoubtedly, I think it's pretty disingenuous to write off legitimate criticisms of Catradora that people offer up in good faith. I mean, honestly, from what I've seen, a lot of people who don't like Catradora ship Adora with Glimmer. With their main complaint being that Catradora is toxic and romanticizes abuse and mistreatment in the same way that, for example, Fifty Shades of Grey does. Can you talk about how toxic Catra x Adora from the Shira reboot is? I feel like I'm being gaslit. I watched the show because I heard great things and wanted to see good representation, but it felt like an abuse fanfic. Catra torments and tries to kill Adora on multiple occasions, never atones or apologizes until five episodes from the ending, yet everyone is applauding the ship because it's gay? I am not ride or die for Catra Dora. I did ship them together in season one. 
Then I shipped Catra with Scorpia in Season 2, because in Season 2, Catra and Scorpia had actual positive character interactions. I didn't ship Catra with anyone in Season 3, because your god she was a hot mess in that season. And then in Season 4, I went right back to shipping Catra Dora again. And some of you may be about to correct me in the comments saying that, ah, shipper, there are five seasons of the show. No, there aren't. Seasons 2 and 3 are just one season that was split into two for no reason, so I'm just going to be referring to it as season 2 throughout this entire video out of spite. Well, anyway, my point is, I do like the Catchadora ship, and I think it's really well written, but I'm also not just going to uncritically defend it no matter what, so I think I have a good perspective to talk about the ship and address the criticisms lobbed toward it. And I also wanted to reconsider things myself, because hearing all the criticisms leveled against it sort of made me do a double take. I obviously don't condone abusive or toxic relationships, so is that what I'm doing by shipping Catradora? In my Sakura rewrite video, I talked at length about why Sasuke and Sakura are a terrible pairing and criticized their toxic and abusive relationship. So am I just employing double standards? Is Catradora just popular because gay? Well, I don't think so, but in this video we will be legitimately considering and trying to answer the question, is Catradora toxic? So, with all that out of the way, let's just get into it. So, the elephant in the room when talking about Catra and Adora's relationship is that, for most of the series, Catra and Adora have a very antagonistic relationship to one another because Catra is the villain. Just because a character is the villain, though, doesn't necessarily mean their relationship to a protagonist is toxic. It could be that the characters actively go out of their way to avoid bringing harm to each other, and at times question if fighting for their goals is truly worth it if it makes the person they care about suffer. A good example is Lelouch and his sister Nanali in Code Geass. The problem people have is that this isn't really the case in She-Ra. Adora doesn't like fighting Catra, but will if necessary, and Catra seems to enjoy fighting against Adora, often doing so with the smuggest of smiles on her face. It doesn't really seem like Catra actually wants to kill Adora. I mean, you could point to some moments in the series where it looks like she tries to kill her, but it's never very focused. She is given multiple opportunities to actually kill her throughout the series, but doesn't, and it more so seems like she wants to capture her, which, yeah, holding someone against their will and saying things like, looks like you're mine now, Adora, not great behavior on Catra's part. Catra also doesn't go very easy in her fights with Adora, being very aggressive with her while Adora more so fights as a defensive measure, and she also draws blood from Adora with her claws. And we see that this behavior is not exclusive to after Adora joins the rebellion. We also see in a flashback that Catra slashes at Adora's face with her claws when she gets angry at her. So, yeah, physical abuse, check. But on top of that, Catra not only treats Adora terribly throughout the series, but she also goes after her friends and people she cares about, bringing a lot of harm to them, often for the purposes of making Adora suffer. And oh yeah, there was also that time that Catra literally tried to destroy the fucking world. So yeah, Catra does a ton of really horrible things throughout the series, and much of it targeted to Adora specifically. Saying it's not the most healthy of ships is kind of putting it mildly. Contrast Catradora with, say, Lumini from the Owl House. Luce and Amity's relationship starts out very rocky at first, with Amity acting pretty terrible towards Luce and her friends, but Amity grows out of this behavior and develops into a better person relatively quickly. After episode 15, she really doesn't exemplify any toxic behavior anymore, and it's nothing but wholesome gay panic moments from that point on, in contrast to how Catra stayed a villain and got worse from seasons 1 to 3. I think the thing that is the most reprehensible about Catra's behavior is that she's not doing what she's doing because she's been brainwashed or forced to. If she wanted to, Catra could simply leave the Horde like Adora did, and she has given multiple chances, and Catra kind of knows the Horde are the bad guys, but doesn't care. Unlike Adora, she never really fell for Shadow Weaver's manipulation, and doesn't ever try to argue with Adora and say, no, you're mistaken, the Horde are actually the good guys, we're bringing order and peace to Etheria. She more or less accepts Adora's premise that the Horde are the bad guys, but still chooses to stay loyal to them because she can. And yeah, without context, a lot of this seems absolutely horrible and unforgivable, but that context is very important to understand for this discussion. So now we have to answer, if Catra is not doing any of these things because she's brainwashed, why is she doing them? 
Katra is an abuser, but much like many abusers, she has also been a victim of abuse herself. A major theme of the series is the cycle of abuse, showing how victims can be turned into perpetrators if the circumstances are right. Throughout pretty much her entire childhood, Katra was emotionally abused and heavily implied to be have been physically abused by Shadow Weaver. And this abuse played a big part in shaping the kind of person she is and how she acts, with Katra going on to mirror a lot of the abusive tendencies that Shadow Weaver showcased towards her. Now, of course, this does not excuse Catra's actions, but it is important in understanding them. Catra really didn't have any friends while she was in the Horde, with the one exception of Adora, who she is incredibly close to and forms an intimate bond with. We see in multiple instances throughout the series that even though Catra's relationship with Adora can be toxic, the two genuinely like hanging out with each other and have a very strong friendship and natural chemistry with one another. Side note, I just wanted to pause for a second to address a kind of weird criticism of Catradora that I've seen thrown around a few times, which is that Catradora is incest because Shadow Weaver is like a mother to both of them. Okay, first of all, they're not related by blood, and I'm not going to go on a whole tangent arguing about if or when a romantic relationship between two adopted siblings counts as incest. I'll save that for a future video I'm planning on my other channel about the moral and scientific implications of incest. For the purposes of this video, though, Shadow Weaver may be a maternal figure to Catra and Adora, but she's not really their mom. I mean, Catra and Adora are described as her wards, not her children, and never throughout the series do Catra or Adora ever call Shadow Weaver their mother. They also never refer to each other as sisters either. Their relationship is clearly portrayed as friends slash lovers, so I don't think this criticism holds any weight. Anyway, getting back to what I was talking about, it is this close and mutual affection for one another that is established at the beginning of the series that is the cornerstone of the romantic tension between the two going forward. Contrast this to Sasuke and Sakura, who had almost no relationship to one another before joining Team 7. Sakura thought Sasuke was hot and knew almost nothing about him on a personal level, and Sasuke borderline hated her. Adora wants to be with Katra, but is not at all surface level or one-sided. It's definitely implied Adora has romantic feelings towards her, though she doesn't really seem to understand them very well. Like the dumb lesbian she is. Katra, on the other hand, definitely seems to be more aware that the feelings she has towards Adora are romantic in nature, and in the finale she tells Adora that she has always loved her. But she chooses to ignore it and acts as if she doesn't care. Why, you ask? Because Kei Shirogane is a mother flippin' tsundere. Hey, I miss you too. In fact, Katra is not just a tsundere, but the quintessential tsundere. She's such a tsundere that she would literally rather the world be destroyed than confess her feelings to Adora. And just like many tsundere's, she is prone to some definite toxic behavior. What is the name of the type of girl who likes a guy, but they can sometimes treat him meanly, or even violently? An asshole. No, it's a, it's a cindere. However, Adora, being the dumb lesbian that she is, does not really seem to notice or call out the toxic behaviors that Catra exhibits during their time at the Horde together. It is only when Adora leaves the Horde that the true extent of Catra's toxicity is revealed to Adora and the audience. Catra demands that Adora come back to the Horde with her, and for a good chunk of Season 1, Catra's primary motivation is trying to get Adora back, because she is bitter about Adora quote-unquote leaving her. But the thing is, that's complete bullshit. Adora did not leave Catra. It's not like she abandoned Catra, she got separated from her on accident, and the second she saw her again, she wanted Catra to go with her and leave the Horde behind. But Catra just refuses to go with Adora, and from a logical perspective, the decision makes absolutely no sense. There is nothing keeping Catra in the Horde. She hates it there, because she's treated terribly by Shadow Weaver, and she really doesn't have any loyalty to it, and Adora was pretty much the only actually good thing in her life, so why would she choose to stay? She even says in Episode 3 that Adora might have had the right idea leaving. Well, even though Catra's decision doesn't make any sense, it also does make sense, because it is still totally in character because of the way that Catra thinks. Because she has been so mistreated and abused throughout her life, Adora is pretty much Catra's only lifeline to genuine happiness. So she is extremely possessive of her, and the series showcases how she will become incredibly jealous and aggressive whenever it feels like other people are becoming more important in Adora's life. To Catra, who has been shown so little love and affection throughout her life, she needs as much of Adora's love and affection as possible. And when Adora displays it in significant amounts towards other people, that means there's less for her. 
Now, this is not true, and in any healthy relationship, a person should be okay with their partners interacting with and caring about other people, but this is just how Catra's mind operates because of her upbringing. So, when she sees Adora telling her that she should follow her and leave the Horde, she doesn't think, Wow, great idea, Adora. I can't wait to leave this horrible place behind. She instead thinks, I can't believe you, Adora. I thought you cared about me, and now you're just going to leave me behind for these strangers you met a day ago? Katra didn't really have a problem with leaving the Horde with Adora, and under different circumstances, she probably would have, but she is simply incapable of accepting the idea that doing the right thing and helping people she just met is more important than being with her. If Katra is going to be with Adora, it has to be on her own terms, because if it isn't, then she has no control over her source of happiness. The desperate desire for control Katra exhibits throughout the series is not from a cold, calculating villain. She isn't dedicated to a cause, she runs on pure emotion and passions, and is more like a child lashing out as a coping mechanism to make herself feel a semblance of safety. We see often throughout the series that Katra is very hesitant to let people get close to her, and frequently assumes the worst in everyone around her because her mind is in constant panic mode as a result of her clear PTSD, which only gets worse after her abuser Shadow Weaver manipulates her in Season 2 into thinking she cares about her, and shows her some semblance of compassion, only for it to be revealed it was all just a trick for her to escape. In episode 5 of season 1, she tries to convince Adora to come back to the Horde with her again, asking when she is finally going to stop messing around. But it's here where she realizes Adora isn't messing around, and she really isn't going to come back to the Horde for Catra's sake. And again, rather than making Catra realize that she needs to abandon the Horde if she doesn't want to lose Adora, this just builds up even more resentment and bitterness in Catra, because in her mind, it shows that their friendship and relationship that they had developed over the course of their whole lives didn't mean anything, because Adora is so willing to prioritize something else on top of it. So if that's the case, then was what they had even real? Does Adora really want Catra in her life at all? And the obvious answer is yes, Adora wants Catra in her life very badly and states multiple times how she wants her to come with her to Brightmoon. But Catra can't see anything other than Adora lecturing her about doing the right thing. But Catra doesn't care about doing the right thing. She's a very amoral, emotionally driven character, and only sees things selfishly in terms of what is best for her, unlike Adora who has a very strong moral conviction. And that's why in Season 3, she does still consider leaving the Horde, despite how resentful she is towards Adora, because she wants to be happy and feel good, and she doesn't want to be stuck in a horrible place with no emotional lifeline. But then, things change, and after Adora leaves the Horde, Catra starts to be given things she never was before. Power and respect. She is promoted a Force Captain by Hordak, who actually values her skills, and puts her abu abusive figure Shadow Weaver in her place. Catra is given command of important missions, and is able to show up Shadow Weaver by implementing a successful plan to capture Adora and the Sword. And that's why Catra gives Adora the Sword later on. Because even though she wants Adora to come back with her, she also kind of doesn't, because it's only after she left that Catra actually gains status and control in the Horde. And she likes it. Catra still hasn't completely burned the bridge with Adora yet, though. In Season 1, Episode 11, Promise, the best episode in the season, while Catra is initially opposed to working with Adora to try to get out of the First One spaceship, she does begrudgingly come around, and the two have a lot of genuinely really wholesome as well as flirtatious interactions with each other as they traverse the inside, showing that Catra still enjoys being around Adora and cares about her. But then, Light Hope just has to fuck everything up, so she shows them a bunch of flashbacks from their memories of when they were growing up. And as they experience them together, Catra's trauma is unearthed, and we see another aspect of Catra's relationship with Adora that just adds even more drama into the mix. Because in addition to Adora being Catra's emotional lifeline, Catra is also jealous of her because of how much better she was treated than her in the Horde. Adora was the golden child who would always get special treatment from Shadow Weaver, so even though Catra relied on Adora for her support and love, she also grew resentful of her for how comparatively easy she had in life, despite them both being of about equal skill in combat. And with how much Catra has been thriving in the Horde after Adora left, all this bubbled up resentment and jealousy in Catra results in the ending of the episode. Catra sees a flashback of Adora comforting her when she was crying and telling her that nothing bad would happen to them as long as they have each other. And one might think this would be the point where Catra realizes how much Adora cares about her and she would stop running away from her feelings and just be with her. But no, that's not what happens. 
Instead, because of how our mind works, Katra has the most bad faith interpretation of this event possible, and comes to the conclusion that Adora has been the one holding her back the entire time, and cutting her out of her life is the best thing to do. And again, this really isn't true at all, but it makes total sense why Katra would feel this way. Pretty much her entire life, she has been in Adora's shadow, constantly the brunt of Shadow Weaver's abuse and torment. Katra wants to have control over her own happiness and sense of self-worth, but both those things were previously tied to Adora, the person constantly being held up as better and more deserving than her. And when Adora chose to stay and fight with the Rebellion, it showed Katra that her happiness and source of self-worth could just pack up and leave if she wanted, because she just wasn't important enough for Adora. It makes Katra feel weak and powerless, which is the last thing she wants to feel. So she concludes that her love and attachment to Adora is the problem, and so rather than trying to get Adora to come back to the Fright Zone, Katra decides to burn the bridge with her and instead focus on realizing her true potential. Because after all, Katra has so much more control over her happiness and self-worth if she ties it to her own success in military accomplishments within the Horde. Right? Well, at first, it definitely seems like it. Immediately after Catra leaves Adora dangling over a cliff in the First One's spaceship, she finally gets some cathartic payback on her abuser Shadow Weaver by defeating her in battle and having her stripped of her position and put in prison. She then gets farther than the Horde ever has before and destroys the Whispering Woods, nearly defeating the Princess Alliance, and for her efforts, she is promoted to Hordak's second-in-command. So, by the end of Season 1, Katra's self-esteem is over the fucking moon, and she's gone all in on the evil Force Captain role. Problem is, as you might expect, this doesn't last. In Season 2, Katra realizes that being on top isn't exactly all it's cracked up to be. Not only does she have to deal with a lot of responsibilities she previously didn't when she was just the grunt who was looked down upon, but she is also constantly under pressure to produce results or else face demotion. Catcher becomes paranoid of failure because she is unable to score real decisive victories over the Rebellion, and she puts herself in dangerous and self-destructive situations so that she can succeed. And eventually her power does get stripped away from her, and she has cost pretty much everything, imprisoned by Hordak and banished to the Crimson Waste. And one of the things I find really interesting about Catcher's reaction to this is that when she's in jail, she says, I did everything right, but it doesn't matter what I do, I don't get to win. But this... <laughs> isn't really true? Katra did fuck up. She allowed Shadow Weaver to escape, and then lied about it to Hordak, which is why she's in the situation she's in. But this is a bit of a pattern for Katra, where she refuses to take responsibility for her own shortcomings, and instead blames them on circumstances outside of her control. And the reason why she does this is once again because of her upbringing and how she was raised. Katra was treated incredibly unfairly throughout her time in the Horde, and no matter what she did, she was always looked down upon and treated like dirt. But rather than forming a traditional inferiority complex like one might expect, Katra actually ended up forming a superiority complex. She was treated horribly for no fault of her own, so in her mind, in the present, whenever something bad happens to her, it's never her fault, it's always someone else's fault. Other people treating her unfairly for no reason again. It's because of this victim mentality that stems from very real trauma and abuse she did endure in the Horde that it's hard for Katra to accept that she is ever the problem, even if she has long since cut the person traumatizing and abusing her out of her life. It's pretty interesting because it's actually the exact opposite reaction Adora has. Yeah, we're actually going to briefly talk about Adora now. I've barely done so yet in this video, and I will barely do so for the rest of this video. Because surprise, bitches, it was a Catra character analysis this whole time. Just like all the Catradora video essays secretly are. Anyway, in all seriousness, Adora was raised to believe she was special and better than everyone, but this treatment actually ends up creating a pseudo-inferiority complex in her. And we see constantly throughout the series that whenever anything goes wrong, Adora always blames herself. She puts an incredible amount of pressure on herself to make things go right in a way that is not necessarily toxic, like with Katra, because she's not bringing harm to other people, but is very unhealthy because it leads to a lot of self-destructive behavior where she puts herself at risk to save other people while not giving a crap about her own well-being. And it makes total sense why she's like this, because Adora was raised from birth to believe that she's the best. She is incredibly uncomfortable with failing and letting people down even when she did everything she possibly could because she's not living up to the expectations that people have for her even if she's long since cut the person who placed those expectations upon her out of her life to quote a mr george lucas see it's it's like poetry it rhymes and it is this perfectly written duality between katra and adora that makes their relationship so interesting to see develop on screen and also the witty banter good devil i could watch their banter for hours on end tired already 
Punching was supposed to be like the one thing you're good at. And this is one of the things I have to emphasize. Even if you think Catra and Adora's relationship is problematic, you can't deny that it is incredibly engaging to watch, like a train wreck in slow motion. Contrast this, again, to Sakura and Sasuke in Naruto. Their relationship is so boring, I couldn't give a single shit about it. Where is the deep emotional core and connection? They have almost no relation to one another as characters whatsoever. Sakura just obsesses over him, despite not really understanding him on any level, and Sasuke basically ignored her throughout most of the series. Until Sakura just somehow ended up burying his child in Boruto? I don't know the details, I don't watch Boruto, who the fuck watches Boruto? And that's why even if I don't ship Naruto and Sasuke together, I can still recognize why it's a better ship than Sasuke x Sakura, because it's just a way more interesting relationship, period, even if it's not really healthy. Naruto and Sasuke do have important drama stemming from their similar backgrounds and their diverging responses to trauma, and Naruto doesn't just want to bring Sasuke back to the village because he's hot. But anyway, let's get back to the Catra analysis, because she's the real star of the show, of course. Well, except for Entrapta. Let's talk about Catra's behavior in the Season 2 climax, where Catra actually tries to destroy the world, and maybe come up with an explanation for why she did what she did. Like I was talking about before, post-season 1, Catra has pretty much gone full villain, tying her self-worth to the power and control she is able to acquire. And when this power and control slips away, it has a very negative effect on her well-being, leading her to engage in self-destructive behavior like taunting Hordak to kill her. However, even though Catra has lost Adora and her status within the Horde, she still hasn't lost everything. She still has two friends that she recently made within the Horde, and Trapta, who was able to get Hordak to spare her life, giving her a second chance. As you can see, the overall productivity of the Horde has increased by 400% since Catra has been your second in command. She's right, you know, and that's why she's best girl. And Scorpia, who decides to stay with her in the Red Waste. And even though Catra starts off being absolutely miserable... She ends up having the time of her life in the Crimson Waste, as she is actually able to relax in a much less stressful and controlling environment than the Horde. She even manages to once again succeed in getting the best of Adora and friends, who are also in the Red Waste, and is ecstatic about using her capture of them to get back in with the Hordak's good graces. But then Scorpia points out something important, which is that there's no reason to go back to the Horde because she is miserable there, and would have a happier life if they just stayed in the Red Waste together. And now I guess we have to talk about Scorpia and how she fits into Catra's character arc. Scorpia is arguably the kindest person in the series, but kindness doesn't necessarily translate to morally good. Unlike Adora, Scorpia is notably not really seen take much issue with the actions the Horde takes, only really desiring to make friends and be loved by the people around her, which makes her a more stable and loyal companion to Catra than Adora, whose strong moral core prevented her from staying in the Horde. And with Adora and Catra on opposite sides of the conflict, Scorpia serves as Catra's sort of temporary love interest. It's pretty obvious Scorpia has a massive crush on Catra, but Catra is initially not very receptive to her because she's mostly focused on getting shit done, As and as Scorpia herself points out, still has an intense bond with Adora even after the separation. However, over the course of the season, Catra definitely comes to appreciate Scorpia's company more and more and arguably somewhat reciprocated her romantic interest in her. And when Scorpia talks to her about staying in the Crimson Waste to be gay and do crime for the rest of their lives, it's clear she genuinely considers it. She may have cut ties with Adora, but she still has the chance to be happy with someone. But then everything goes to shit, because Catra finds out that Shadow Weaver is in Bright Moon and escaped from the Fright Zone to go see Adora. So Catra tells Scorpia they are returning to the Fright Zone to crush the Rebellion. The reason why she decides this is because this reveal just further emphasizes what Catra was already thinking. She came to the conclusion that Adora was what had been holding her back all her life, and she was the reason she had been treated so unfairly. And you can see that during their encounters, Catra is constantly focused on showing Adora up because she is trying to prove that she isn't weak and limited by Adora. And that's why Catra likes being so domineering over Adora, because it gives her validation that she has self-worth and strength by her own merits. So when she realizes her abuser Shadow Weaver left her after manipulating her into doing what she wanted, which ruined her standing within the Horde, what that tells her is that it's once again Adora's fault. It's once again all her hopes and accomplishments being dashed because of Adora's very existence, and she can't let that stand. 
Again, if circumstances were different, Catra probably would have been just fine just staying in the Crimson Waste because she was not happy in the Horde, but she is incapable of accepting that her circumstances are dictated by Adora. So, she takes Adora and the sword back to the Fright Zone to redeem herself. But once again, these moments of triumph and success for Catra are fleeting. The princesses storm the Fright Zone to rescue Adora, and Catra is told by Entrapta that they can't open the Hordax portal because it would rip a hole in the fabric of space-time. But Catra doesn't care because all she hears Entrapta say is that Adora was right. Once again, Adora is the one controlling her fate. Adora is the one getting in the way of her succeeding. So Catra is dead set on opening the portal no matter what. So she betrays Entrapta and activates the portal because at this point she truly has nothing left to lose. She cut herself off from Adora. She rejected a chance to be happy with Scorpia. She betrayed Entrapta. The only thing she has left, in her mind anyway, is what she put so much effort into maintaining her victory, and she says that she would rather have the whole world be destroyed than let Adora win. It's an extremely illogical and overblown emotional reaction to her circumstances, but the thing that makes it and Catra's entire character arc work is that nothing she ever does in the series ever goes against the character traits that have been established for her. This is a logical progression of the type of person Catra has demonstrated herself to be. And I just have to give so much praise for this, because I recently got around to watching the Tangled animated series on Disney Plus on a recommendation. And in that series, there is a show original character called Cassandra who is shockingly similar to Catra in so many ways. By the way, spoiler warning for Tangled the animated series, please skip to this time on the screen if you have not yet seen it. So in the series, Cassandra is Rapunzel's best friend, and they form an incredibly close bond with each other. And Cassandra, yes, definitely, absolutely has repressed romantic feelings for Rapunzel, and you cannot convince me otherwise the animators knew exactly what they were doing. And much like Catra, Cassandra eventually goes through an angsty gay dummy mommy phase, with the source of conflict being almost identical to what it is in She-Ra. Cassandra is resentful because she feels like Rapunzel's very existence is responsible for the difficult circumstances in her life, and her inability to succeed, even though she still loves her. They even share the same toxic and abusive maternal figure. Both She-Ra and Tangled the series were releasing episodes around the same time period, but it is clear when watching the two shows that Catra's writing was so much better than Cassandra's in pretty much every way. Although the pieces were there for Cassandra's villain arc, they were never actually put together coherently, with the Moonstone plotline of Season 3 being strung together by contrived, out-of-character decisions Cassandra makes, with paper-thin motivations for doing so. It seems like the writers had an idea for where they wanted to take Cassandra's character, but no idea how to actually get there and make her decisions feel like a natural extension of the character traits she was established as having. And me being me, who likes to think about rewrites for how shows and movies could have been better, I honestly found it really difficult to think about how I would have handled Cassandra's character arc better, because ultimately this is just such a difficult character arc to actually pull off successfully without it feeling contrived or infuriating or melodramatic. But Noelle Stevenson still managed to succeed with Catra, making her one of the most interesting and complex characters in fiction, and I think that deserves all the praise in the world. By the way, if this Catradora video does do well, let me know in the comments below if you want me to one day make a video going over why Catra succeeds where Cassandra fails. And I might do it, who knows. But anyway, with that tangent out of the way, after the portal opens, we are shown an alternate reality with what Catra really wants, which is a less toxic environment where she can still be with Adora. And then reality literally starts breaking through the seams, and Catra takes yet one more step into hot topic edginess, getting part of her face consumed by darkness. Hey, Adora. With half her brain basically decomposing, Catra acts the cruelest and most spiteful towards Adora she ever is in the series, beating her, gaslighting her, telling her that everything is her fault, and that she is the reason she turned out this way. It's absolutely horrible, and scenes like this are the reason why so many people say that Catradora is a toxic ship, because Catra is being emotionally and physically abusive to Adora, just like Shadow Weaver was to Catra. However, when analyzing any piece of media, it is always important to ask one simple question. Is portrayal the same as endorsement? Does the series in any way romanticize or make light of this horrible, toxic behavior from Catra? And the answer is unquestionably no. This is framed as very clearly incredibly disturbing and terrifying in the show, and is also the moment where Adora finally decides to stand up for herself and call Catra out. 
You broke the world, and it is all your fault. No, it's not! I didn't make you pull the switch. I didn't make you do anything! I didn't break the world, but I am gonna fix it. And you, you made your choice. Damn, that is one satisfying punch. What this moment clearly demonstrates is that Adoria is done with Catra's shit. Before, she was still harboring feelings of guilt for what happened and feeling responsible in a way for how Catra ended up. But in this moment, she finally realizes that no matter the circumstances, and no matter how difficult a life Catra has had, in the end, only Catra is responsible for her own behavior, not Adora. Hey, uh, Kishimoto, where was this moment for Sakura, huh? Even after Sasuke tries to kill Sakura twice, she still loves him and wants to be with him and never has a moment where she calls him out and tells him off. It never happens. But this moment in Shira is incredibly important for Adora's character, and especially Katra's, because it is the first time she is directly called out for her toxicity by someone whose opinion she cares about. Another thing I have to mention in regards to the comparison to Sakura and Sasuke is that, unlike with Sakura, Adora's motivations are not centered around trying to get Katra back. Even though Adora obviously wants Katra to leave the Horde and be with her, Adora's main goal is stopping the Horde and the threat it poses to Etheria, and she clearly understands that Katra is a danger that needs to be fought against. Katra is honestly more obsessed with Adora than Adora is with her, and consistently bases her decisions around her throughout the show. By contrast, in Naruto, Sasuke doesn't really give a fuck about Sakura and is just focused on his revenge, and Sakura is mostly focused on getting him back, rather than dealing with a very dangerous criminal and traitor who could wreak havoc on the Leaf Village and the Ninja World. Adora is not accepting of Catra's bad behavior, and grows further and further away from her as the series goes on and Catra's actions become more extreme, rather than just continuing to love her no matter what, like Sakura. So after Adora repairs the world in the season 2 finale and gives Catra a pants-shitting death stare, in season 3 of the show, Catra and Adora notably barely have any interactions at all, which is probably why season 3 is the most boring season. Also, Best Girl is only in it for 3 episodes. But this season is still very important in terms of character development, especially for Catra, because it's the Catra show! Catra continues going down the dark path she set out on, trying to claim even more power for herself within the Horde. This results in a very uneasy partnership with Hordak, and as Catra pushes herself farther and farther in hopes of success, it of course takes an enormous toll on her mental health and her relationship with Scorpia. Catra has pretty much put all of her self-worth into winning the fight against Adora and the princesses, but doing so is not going to be easy, so the paranoia of failure constantly eats away at her. She is still in denial about anything being her fault, so she is incredibly demanding of her soldiers, pushing them to the breaking point, and pushing her friendship with Scorpia to the breaking point as well. Scorpia still wants to be there for Catra because she is so nice and because she still has feelings for her, and Catra just takes this for granted, not really appreciating anything she does for her anymore or caring about what she wants. So Scorpia in the end can't deal with this toxicity anymore and leaves after telling Catra that she's a bad friend. This portrays a clear message that dedicating yourself to another person no matter how they treat you is not a good thing. And this is the second time Catra is called out for her toxicity by someone whose opinion she cares about. Even so, Catra just continues digging a deeper and deeper hole for herself, convinced that if she wins the war for Etheria, everything she sacrificed, all the bridges she burned, will finally have been worth it. But even she recognizes she isn't really happy, and with Scorpia gone, her mental health continues deteriorating. She doesn't get sleep, she lashes out at the slightest annoyance, and she sobs uncontrollably to herself alone. The only thing Catra is still holding on to is the chance of accomplishing her goal and beating Adora and the princesses. And Double Trouble, someone who she actually enjoys the company of. But then, in the season 3 finale, both those things are ripped away from her, as it is revealed that Double Trouble betrayed her and worked with the princesses to completely ruin her plans. And then, for the third time, someone whose opinion Catra cares about calls her out for her toxicity. You know, it took me a while, but I finally figured out your character. You try so hard to play the big, bad villain, but your heart's never been in it, has it? What, what are you... Stop! Stop it! People have hurt you, haven't they? They didn't believe in you. 
They didn't trust you. Didn't need you. <laughs> Left you. <laughs> but did you ever stop to think? Maybe they're not the problem? It's you. You drive them away, Wildcat. After doubling down again and again, when she is pretty much left with nothing and no hope for victory, this is where Katra finally starts to reassess her behavior and accept that she is the cause of so many of her problems. And left utterly defeated, she surrenders to Glimmer, accepting possible death for her actions. Of course, Glimmer doesn't kill her though, and then Horde Prime shows up, abducting both of them, and we're on to the final season now, baby! So things are looking pretty dire with an alien invasion going on, and Adora is pretty much putting herself through the ringer to rescue Glimmer from Horde Prime's ship. Keyword, Glimmer. At this point, Adora is not focused on Catcher's well-being, because she still views her as having made her own choice to follow down a dark and evil path, but Glimmer is still worth saving, even though she has definitely made some mistakes of her own. Catra has to earn a second chance, it won't just be given to her. While on Prime's ship, Catra shows signs that she is changing from who she used to be, going out of her way to protect Glimmer from Horde Prime. She also shows some indication that she is simply going back to her old ways, looking for angles on how she can once again seize power for herself, and use Glimmer as a bargaining chip to get in Horde Prime's good graces. Catra is at a fork in the road. A crossroads of destiny, if you will forgive the Avatar reference, where she is wavering between continuing down the road she's been sickened to, or finally trying to do the right thing. The key thing that influences her decision is her interactions with Glimmer, who the series has been subtly building an unspoken connection with Catra for some time. When you think about it, Glimmer is the best character the creators could have stuck with Catra on the ship, because there are a lot of similarities between the two. Just like Catra, Glimmer is also very ambitious. She showcases cunning and manipulation, and the drive to succeed regardless of consequences, and she has an innate need to prove she is capable for her own sake. And most of all, just like Catra, Glimmer eventually has a falling out with Adora, becoming resentful when she feels like she has to just go along with whatever Adora says, and then puts victory and success in battle above all else, even risking horrible, catastrophic destruction in the process, just like Catra did. What I'm trying to say is they're both fucking Slytherins. The difference, of course, is their upbringings. Catra was raised in an extremely harsh, abusive environment, where she was constantly vilified and made to feel guilt over any weakness, whereas Glimmer was raised in a much more supportive and healthy environment with an actually good parental figure, and the values of friendship and compassion were praised and rewarded. That's why, after Glimmer almost unleashes the heart of Etheria, putting the universe in danger because of her tunnel vision, she immediately regrets her decision and is apologetic about it, realizing and admitting that she royally fucked up, literally, unlike Catra, who just keeps doubling down throughout the story whenever she screws up. While on the ship, Catra and Glimmer are actually able to talk to each other for the first time, where they aren't bitter enemies, kind of by necessity since everyone else on the ship is a mind-controlled drone, their conversations in the episode Corridors are some of my favorite scenes in the series. Catra hears her talking about how much she liked hanging out with Adora and Bo, and thinks back on how much fun she used to have just being friends with Adora and hanging out with her. When Glimmer talks about how much she's screwed up and wants to fix her relationship with Adora and Bo, she is unintentionally calling out Catra, who by this point realizes just how badly she completely screwed up all of her relationships because of her own actions, and didn't take any effort to actually try and fix them because she thought winning would make her happy. Catra is jealous of Glimmer and how good she had it with both Adora and her friends, and the possibility that she could still have those good times back again, while Catra can't because she went way too far. However, unlike previously, Catra's jealousy doesn't manifest as resentment towards Glimmer. It's much more self-reflective, as she thinks about how things could have turned out so much better if she hadn't made so many mistakes, and she actually manages to empathize with Glimmer on the ship. By this point, Catra is in a prison of her own making. She can't just go back to having a relationship with Adora like she used to because she has done so many terrible things to her, and she can't push the boundaries of her control any longer because she quickly realizes she doesn't have an opportunity to do that on Horde Prime's ship. He has little use for her other than as an obedient pawn. But Catra still does have one option available to her. While she can't do something to selfishly help herself, she can do something to help someone else. She realizes Adora is on her way to Prime's ship to rescue Glimmer, and will be captured by Horde Prime, and Glimmer begs her to finally do one good thing in her life. 
Katra then thinks back to her time with Adora and how no matter what happened during their time in the Horde, Adora always supported Katra and showed her love and affection, even when tr Katra treated her poorly. And it's only now, after all the terrible things she did and the mistakes she made and the failures she was responsible for, that she stops seeing Adora's promise to her that she made to protect her like she has up until this point. Adora wasn't the one holding her back. She wasn't the cause of all her misfortune, hardships, and abuse. She was the only respite from them. And she has no one to blame for causing her relationship with Adora to self-destruct but herself. So Katra finally decides to do the first good selfless action in her life to repay Adora for all the unreciprocated kindness and compassion she showed her, and she finally takes some goddamn responsibility for her mistakes in one of the most cathartic and emotional scenes in the show. Uh, Adora, I'm sorry uh, for everything! Once again, this decision to finally do the right thing and try to make up for all of her past actions feels like a completely natural development of Catra's character, considering everything that builds up to it. However, it's not the end of Catra's story, nor her relationship with Adora, because after hearing about how Catra sacrificed herself to save Glimmer, Adora doesn't feel right just leaving her with Prime and wants to go and rescue her, because after everything, Adora is finally given hope again that there is some good in Catra and she might really be capable of change. And this is where some people might take issue with Catradora. Catra does so many horrible things and treats Adora so horribly throughout the series, and yet the second she shows one single instance of actual good behavior, Adora immediately wants to go back to her. To some people, this is an endorsement of abusive relationships because it mirrors how in real life, abusers will sometimes act like they've changed and show their partners genuine kindness for the purposes of keeping them in the abusive relationship by giving them hope that things can just get better if they put enough work into it, when really the abuser has no intention of actually becoming better at all. This cycle of abuse chart on screen explains it pretty well. There's the honeymoon phase where the abuser apologizes, shows remorse, and begs for forgiveness, and promises never to do the same thing again. Then there is the calm phase where the abuse and bad behavior temporarily stops, and the abuser makes hollow, positive gestures towards the abused. In the tension-building phase, the relationship will become more and more unpleasant as the abuser withdraws these hollow, positive gestures over time and starts repeating previous bad behavior. Then, in the incident phase, all of this comes to a head where the verbal, emo emotional, and physical abuse occurs once again. However, and I say this knowing that not all cases of abusive relationships are exactly the same, there are several reasons why this analogy doesn't work that well in Season 5 of She-Ra. The first reason is that Catra was not saving Glimmer for the purposes of getting back into Adora's good graces. In Catra's mind, there isn't anything she can do to repair her relationship with Adora anymore. She is doing what she is doing purely to protect Adora with nothing to gain from it for herself, and directly makes clear to Adora that she doesn't want to be rescued, and wants Adora to stay away from her. Catra has clear suicidal tendencies that have been demonstrated multiple times throughout the series, and now, when she truly has nothing left and no way out, she decides to end it all and sacrifice herself, fully intending to die for Adora's sake. Now, some people might say that this is where Catra's story should have ended. After doing so many horrible things to Adora and her friends, her making some kind of sacrifice at the end is the only small bit of redemption she could hope for. But that's the easy way, otherwise known as the Shadow Weaver way. Catra deciding to save Glimmer and finally apologizing to Adora is only her first step towards actually taking responsibility for her actions, but it's far from complete. Catra would rather die than actually facing Adora and the people she hurt and trying to make things better with them, because that takes real effort. All I know about being good, I learned from TV. And in TV, flawed characters are constantly showing people they care with these surprising grand gestures, and I think that part of me still believes that's what love is. But in real life, the big gesture isn't enough. You need to be consistent. You need to be dependably good. You can't just screw everything up and then take a boat out in the ocean to save your best friend or solve a mystery and fly to Kansas. You need to do it every day, which is so hard. It is Catra's genuine effort to shed her toxic behaviors and become a better person that is another reason why the abuse analogy I mentioned before doesn't really fit Catradora. I mean, don't get me wrong, after Adora ends up rescuing Catra from Prime, everything isn't just fine, and Catra still has a lot of baggage she needs to work through, which is realistic, people don't just suddenly become a totally different person overnight. She acts rudely and angrily to Adora, and demands to be dropped off somewhere so she never has to see Adora and her friends again, but this isn't out of hatred, it's out of guilt. Catra feels so horrible about everything she did, and is in disbelief Adora would actually want to go back and save her, and that she still cares about her. 
and Adora, who was given hope before that Catra and her could actually try to fix their fucked up relationship, is incredibly disappointed with Catra's behavior, especially how Catra is continuing to screw them all over by refusing to have her chip removed that is acting as a tracker for Horde Prime. However, while Catra is still far from fixing all her toxic attitudes, she does show a genuine desire to try. And this is mostly because, once again, she feels like she owes it to Adora and her friends. They went back to save her when they didn't have to and are still willing to give her a second chance after everything. So Catra tries to actually return some of their kindness and help them. Rather than running away, Catra decides to fix the hurt she has caused, using her connection to Horde Prime to help Adora and friends find out what his plans are at the cost of her own well-being, and she stops being so stubborn and allows Entrapted to remove her chip, and she actually works to try to become a better person. No! Don't! I'm sorry. I got angry. It's something I'm working on. Oh, you are? It is also through her chance to interact with Adora and her friends that she gains a much more healthy mindset on relationships and happiness. She sees for the first time in her life what a healthy and supportive environment should be and wants to be a part of it because it actually makes her feel good and is much more stable than the temporary and precarious highs she was on while she was gaining power within the Horde. You can say she doesn't deserve to be given this chance, and that's fair. Adora and her friends were under no obligation to rescue Catra and show her any kindness, even after what she did to save Glimmer, but whether you agree with it or not, they still made their choice to do so, and even though it might feel more fair and emotionally gratifying to see Catra continue to suffer for her actions, being shown love and support is what Catra actually needs to make a change right now not scorn and hatred. And she does change, and she becomes a better person, not just because she feels like she owes it to Adora and her friends for saving her, but also because she realizes it's in her best interest too. She also realizes her previous conception of love was completely misguided in pretty much every way. As I talked about in the start of this video, the whole reason why Catra initially refuses to leave the Horde with Adora is because she is under the mistaken impression that if Adora cares about things outside of her, then it isn't really true love. Because in her mind, the more love and care Adora has for other people, the less there is for her. But when she is with Adora and her friends, she realizes she's wrong. It's completely healthy for your partner to care about and dedicate time to other people outside of you, and getting to know them and accept them in your life means more love and support, not less. She also realizes that morality and doing the right thing does matter, and isn't simply something that gets in the way of your accomplishments and happiness. Doing good things is also beneficial to yourself, as when Catra actually tries to help other people rather than stepping over them, she is helped in return. You can say this should be obvious, but it's never been obvious to Catra because of the way she was raised and the conditions she endured. Even though she wasn't brainwashed into believing the Horde's propaganda necessarily, ultimately the values and interactions normalized there are the only ones she's ever known, so it still feels satisfying to see her finally understand a different and better way to view relationships. Ultimately, over time, Catra is accepted back into Adora's good graces, and they join together to fight against Horde Prime to protect the universe. And after Catra tries to become a better person and shed her toxic behavior, she grows closer to Adora again, and they once again go back to being incredibly close, drawing on their previous lifelong friendship, only now it's a better relationship than it used to be because of Catra's newfound realizations and change in attitude. Catra does not exhibit the cycle of abuse I outlined before, as she is initially not focused on showing Adora kindness and positive gestures for the purposes of win winning back Adora's affection, and is still very closed off to her and pushes her away. Rather than the building of tension, there is a gradual relaxation of tension as Catra over time lets go of her anger, learning to treat Adora better, and there is no incident where she goes back to abusing her. For people saying that Adora and Catra's relationship is still just going to go back to being abusive and toxic later down the line, I mean, maybe relapses aren't an impossibility, but there is nothing in the text of the show that supports this scenario. But of course, things can't just be all PG keen yet, because this bitch just had to butt in again. Catra and Adora are not fully able to complete their character arcs because the source of their trauma, Shadow Weaver, who instilled the toxic behaviors in Catra that led to everything going wrong in the first place, is still around, and clearly has not changed. She continues to try to fuck up Catra and Adora's relationship by telling Adora that Catra is a distraction, and that in order to defeat Horde Prime, she needs to focus and cast her out of her life. This makes Catra temporarily regress, and she once again becomes resentful of how she is playing second fiddle with Adora being the chosen one who needs to save everyone, while she is just getting in the way. 
I also have to emphasize that this regression from Catra's character is not a sign that she will just go back to her old ways in Adora and Catra's future relationship. Unlike beforehand, where Catra still demonstrated toxic and abusive behaviors long after Shadow Weaver was out of the picture, the source of Catra and Adora's conflict in the final stretch of Season 4 is 100% linked to Shadow Weaver, and if she wasn't there, things would have just been fine. Shadow Weaver's manipulations once again have a very detrimental effect on her self-esteem, and rather than staying with Adora, she chooses to leave but this time not for her own selfish motives, but because she believes Adora is just better off without her. Adora doesn't need her. Adora doesn't want her. She's just letting her tag along because she's a good person. But Adora isn't totally without fault here either, because she half agrees with Shadow Weaver, even though she is incredibly angry at her continued manipulations, pulling the two of them apart again. She decides to shoulder the responsibility of stopping Horde Prime alone, which once again gets back to the very unhealthy attitude Adora still hasn't fully gotten over that I mentioned before. She doesn't hesitate to absorb the failsafe, even when it has a very real chance of killing her, because on some level, which is amplified by Shadow Weaver's presence, she doesn't care about her own well-being and has this inferiority complex where whenever anything goes wrong, it's always on her and she needs to be the one to fix things because her own worth is in what she can give to other people. But before Catra leaves Adora, she is actually the one to call out Adora this time, telling her she pays so much attention to other people's needs. But what does she actually want? Doesn't she deserve happiness too? In the end, Catra of course doesn't actually run away and goes back to save Adora and support her partner when she was in trouble. In the finale, Catra and Adora's character arcs come full circle as Catra realizes she is so much more than just a burden if she actually puts in the effort to support and care for Adora unconditionally, and she confesses her love to her. And Adora realizes she doesn't have to shoulder everything onto herself, and that her actually healthy relationship with Catra is not holding her back, but instead it was her unhealthy mindset of not feeling like she deserved real love and happiness. Adora says she loves Catra back, they kiss, the gays cried tears of joy, and the ultimate message Shira is trying to portray is brought into focus, which is that love is all you need to save the world, and it is not a hindrance or a distraction that keeps you from reaching your full potential, and it is the acceptance and nurturing of such feelings that allows you to become a better person and live your best life. A simple message, but a powerful one that has been expertly woven through the events of the story with incredible character writing. But again, a lot of people still take issue with this ending. To them, it just doesn't feel right that the so-called happiness Adora attains at the end of the show is being in a relationship with the person that was the cause of so much misery and pain in her life. Adora deserved be Thus, a lot of people say that for Catra's redemption arc to feel truly earned, she shouldn't have ended up with Adora in the end, because she simply did too much damage to the relationship that can't be forgiven, and her story should just end with her accepting that she has done too much to hurt Adora, and things can't simply go back to the way they were. Catra needs to accept that she is not entitled to Adora, and finally let go of her obsession with her. And Adora would end up in a relationship with a much more supportive partner who has been a genuine source of joy and kindness throughout her life after leaving the Horde, like Glimmer. And I'll be honest, I'm not totally opposed to this idea on paper. I mean, I did ship Glimmadora a bit throughout my time watching the show. They are very cute together and have way less baggage than Catradora. Apparently, the YouTube algorithm likes Glimmadora more too, since it blocked my Catra Sundere edit for copyright. But not this video. I mean, I won't deny that there was probably a little something something going on there. Though, if I'm being perfectly honest, I think Glimmer might have actually had a bigger crush on Catra than Adora. I mean, she literally smooches Catra before Adora does, and Catra is portrayed as a sexy femme fatale in her fantasy scenario. Bruh, I'm telling you, Catra licking her awoke something in Glimmer. <laughs> There are issues from a story perspective, though, that make me prefer Catch Adora as the endgame ship. The first is that this idea of Adora moving on to someone else after Catra ruined her relationship with her would feel redundant because it was already done with Scorpia. Yeah, remember her? She didn't like how Catra was treating her, left her, and moved on to be with someone else. I know the ship isn't canon, but it is in my heart. These two Hufflepuff cinnamon rolls deserve each other. My second issue is that even though I like Glimmadora well enough, I simply prefer Glimbo more because they're just too cute together, and if Bo isn't being shipped with Glimmer, that means the only other viable candidates for Bo are Perfuma, which messes up my Scorpia ship like I said before, or Seahawk, which I can't ship Seahawk with Mermista, and, and you know, the whole house of cards just comes crashing down. But the main reason why Catradora as an endgame ship works is because it perfectly pays off the themes that the series has been building upon throughout its run. The problem isn't that Catra was entitled to Adora's love. 
Adora did love her, their relationship was not one-sided, and she wanted to be close to her when they were in the Horde. The problem is that Catra squandered Adora's love for her. She couldn't accept it as it was, and only wanted it as she thought it should be, and it was Catra turning away from her feelings and viewing them as a weakness that led to all of the horrible things she did. Classic Sundere trait, and she's a fucking Sundere. Catra allowing herself to simply be with the person she loves without obsessing over how other people are taking her away from her or Adora showing her up and making her look weak is the logical resolution to Catra's character arc. And yes, Adora seeing her closest friend that she was together with for so long and knew before she was ever She-Ra come back to her and actually put in the effort to change and be better is possibly the greatest source of happiness for her, certainly more than just locking Catra up or just having her ride off into the sunset never to be seen again. At the end of the day, after all the toxicity and abuse and hurt, Kachadora is a love story about healing and breaking the cycle of abuse and portrays the idea that your relationships and your sense of self-worth do not have to be shackled by the abusive circumstances of your upbringing. Well, some detractors might still say, so what if Kachadora is a logical endgame of the story and themes? It doesn't matter. It's still toxic and problematic because even if Katra did put in the effort to genuinely try to change and make up for her past actions, Katra still got off too easy considering the sheer scope of all the things she did throughout the series. And honestly, on this point, I do somewhat agree. Katra did get off a little too easily. When she gets back to Etheria, while the Rebellion is hesitant to accept her, they still do without that much conflict or need for Katra to prove herself to them. It would have been better and more satisfying if we could have seen Katra trying to bond with and make amends with all of the other princesses individually before taking on Horde Prime, sort of like Zuko did in Avatar. We could have seen, for example, a Catra and Frosta episode where Frosta makes Catra realize the full extent of the negative consequences of Catra's previous actions, with how her attack on the Northern Kingdom dragged an 11 and 3 quarters child into a war zone and the traumatizing impact that that had on her. This would not only do wonders for Frosta's character and make her feel less like Discount Toph, as well as make up for the fact that the actual Toph never got her own field trip episode with Zuko, but also tie in well with Catra's own traumatic childhood and how she was also a victim of war, indirectly anyway. Also, a massive elephant in the room for Catra's redemption arc that is never brought up is that Catra is kind of the reason Glimmer's mother is trapped in another dimension for all of eternity. I didn't notice it the first time I watched season 4, but yeah, even though I think Glimmer and Catra's interactions in the season are great, it's just such a missed opportunity not to actually address this and all the conflict and drama that would come from it. I think the main reason it feels like Catra kind of got off the hook too easily is because there were only eight episodes left in the series after Catra was rescued from Horde Prime's sh spaceship to wrap everything up. A fifth season definitely would have helped in wrapping up some of the loose ends the finale left, but yes, it is still a flaw I have with not Catra's writing specifically, but just the way her redemption arc was handled in general. I mean, the most that Perfuma, the most opposed to accepting Catra, can muster in terms of condemnation of her actions is that Catra was a bad friend to Scorpia. And I'm just like, girl, this woman was a key and willing figure in the evil empire that tried to colonize your land and enslave your people. And the most you can say against her is that she was a bad friend? And that's sort of a drawback of the fact that She-Ra is such a character-driven show, and it puts so much attention into the characters and their relationships with one another, so actions that affect the world and citizens of Etheria just don't seem to matter as much. I mean, because it is a kid's show, it's never shown explicitly, but Catra was fighting on the side of an evil empire in a real war that undoubtedly killed a lot of people. But the show does not linger on Catra grappling with this, and instead focuses on her trying to make up for the wrong she did specifically to the characters the audience actually cares about. The problem isn't just exclusive to Catra, though, and is also an issue with other former Horde soldiers like Scorpia, Kyle, Lani, and Rahelio, and most obviously, Hordek who was a ruthless dictator who kidnapped children and brainwashed them to fight in his army to colonize and subjugate the peaceful denizens of Etheria. And in the finale, he is just kind of allowed to keep living freely, I guess? It's not really made that clear, because he broke free from his brother's control and fought unsuccessfully to try and free Entrapta. It just doesn't really feel earned. But I'll allow it, because it means best girl is happy and Entrapta can be canon. That's right, we stand and trap deck here. They are so precious together, don't deny it, and it's not fucking creepy, they're both consenting adults, and no one was getting in a tizzy about Micah marrying someone who lived for thousands of years. 
This problem is also not exclusive to the She-Ra series either. I've noticed more and more over the years how there's a big pattern with villain characters being redeemed too easily despite not doing enough to actually make up for their past actions, especially in media aimed for younger audiences. I mean, let's take Star Wars, where Darth Vader slaughters children and works to enforce the rule of a tyrannical authoritarian dictatorship for over two decades of his life. But then, at the end, he just gets to be a force ghost with Yoda and Obi-Wan because he turned against the Emperor and killed him at the last possible second? What?! Zuko's redemption arc from Avatar The Last Airbender is really one of the only redemption arcs I can think of that was handled completely perfectly. He comes to all the conclusions he should for all the right reasons, and actually does enough to where it really does genuinely make up for all of the bad things he did before. However, just because Catra's redemption arc isn't absolute perfection, doesn't mean it's bad. It's still handled competently. I mean, it could be much worse. We could be watching Steven Universe! You are not half human, you're just acting like a child! I am a child. What's your excuse? No! God, please, no! No! So anyway, after... How long has this video been going on by now? Oh, dear Lucifer, over an hour? Why are you like this? Uh, well, anyway, after everything I talked about in this extremely overlong video essay that definitely should have been trimmed down way more, now we finally get to answer the question posed at the beginning of the video. Is Catradora toxic? Well, undoubtedly Catradora was toxic. For the first three seasons, it is not at all a portrayal of a healthy and loving relationship, and Noelle Stevenson and the other writers are very aware of this fact and do not treat it as positive. But the question we should be act asking is... Is Catradora still toxic? And in my view, no, not by the point where the show ends in season 4. Adora has changed and become someone who is capable of standing up for herself, no longer blames herself for the actions other people take outside of her control, and has learned to place value in her own happiness. Meanwhile, Catra not only expressed remorse for her previous actions, but actually put in the effort to try to make up for them, and work to grow past her previous toxic attitudes, so she could become someone who is deserving of Adora. But that's the key word there that some people, even after watching this entire video essay to the end, might still take issue with. Deserve. Does Catra really deserve Adora? Do abusers deserve happiness as a reward even if they change and try to make up for their mistakes? In the end, Catra Dora is still a story about an abuser ending up in a relationship with their victim in the end, and for people in real life who are actual victims of abuse, I can understand why that might be triggering, why it doesn't sit right with them, when in a lot of cases just separating yourself from that abusive individual and moving on with your life is the best thing to do. I have never been a victim of abuse, nor have I ever been in or will ever be in a romantic partnership, so it doesn't feel right for me to say that abuse victims' concerns with Cachador are invalid. However, I will also point out that I also don't think it is right to say that abuse victims who relate a lot to Catra's struggle and feel for her and feel like Catradora gives them hope that they can grow past their abuse are invalid either. In the end, I can only give my own opinion on it, and in my opinion, which is I think the same opinion Noelle Stevenson holds, is that no, abusers do not deserve happiness, but at the same time it shouldn't be forbidden to them either if they actually put in the hard work that is necessary to change. It also must be said that forgiving someone after they fully admit to wrongdoing and take steps to correct their mistakes is not the same as forgiving someone because, you know, the past is the past and we should just let bygones be bygones. Right, Ellen? Now, do I think that the Shira fandom can go overboard with artists portraying Kachadora as this incredibly wholesome, wonderful, magical relationship? Yeah, I do think that's a legitimate complaint, because in the end, that's not what Kachadora is. It isn't this pure, adorable, fluff Yuri ship to consume if you need to brighten your day. It's incredibly messy and angsty and deals with stuff like abuse, trauma, and toxicity. But in my opinion, it is handled with grace, and because it is so rife with so many issues and problems, I love seeing it explored and developed on screen, which is why I'm in great anticipation for a chance to explore Catra and Adora's relationship after the end of the war in the she movie that is going to be coming to Netflix in the future. Allegedly. Hopefully. Seriously, when is it coming? I need it! In the meantime, though, I would love to see more fan-made works in the same vein of the excellent Don't Go She-Ra animatic, which feels like it could be an actual canon scene dealing with the trauma and self-doubt in Catra and Adora's relationship. 
In the end, though, what Kajidora is trying to teach its audience is that even when you think you have done so many bad things and put so much hurt onto other people you care about, it is never too late to make a change, to be better, and doing so is always better than simply running away or doubling down, and that it is okay to be vulnerable, and vulnerability isn't the same as weakness. And I think that is a fantastic message, and is as far away from a pro-abuse narrative as you can get. So that, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, is why I personally ship Catchadora. And also because gay. Hope you had a happy Pride Month, everyone. I didn't. I haven't had a single day off of work in over three weeks, which is why this video took almost a month to make. Excuse me while I go kill myself trying to get the Attack on Titan video essay done by next week.